Welcome to today's lecture. I am your presenter, medical licentiate Elemo Mwanza. Today we're going to talk about early pregnancy problems. In particular, we're going to talk about abortions or miscarriages. We'll first define what abortions are and also we'll look at the incidences of abortions. So abortions can be defined into two parts. You can use the definition of abortion depending on the gestation age. And also you can use the definition of abortion looking at the fetal weight. In definition regards to the gestation age, we we'll define abortion as any fetal loss of conception until the term of fetal viability. And we are talking about viability in focus, what we mean is a 24 weeks gestation. Apart from that, we can also define it looking at the weight of the fetus, which will say this is an expulsion of a fetus or an embryo that is weighing less than 500 grams. Also, we have to look at the prevalence or rather the incidence that is happening. When you look at this incidence, basically, you consider the losses that occur to clinical recognition. Because as we go further with this presentation, we will see the different types of abortion. Basically, the incidence that we have in Zambia is in the ranges of 15 to 20 percent loss of pregnancies. Classification. How are we going to classify these abortions? These abortions can be classified into two parts. We we'll make the first classification as simultaneous abortion. What do we mean when we say simultaneous abortion? It's simultaneous an abortion is the one that occurs without any medical or mechanical means, meaning that any trained personnel or medical personnel has no influence in this one. Also, we can also think about it, an induced abortion. This is where all the criminal abortions come in when you talk about it, induced abortion. For us to nicely understand what is happening in abortions, it is very important to understand the pathophysiology that lies behind miscarriages or abortions. Let's look at this pathophysiology. What happens is that this endometrium has what we call the decidua bacillus. In this decidua bacillus, what will happen is that there will be a hemorrhage. When this hemorrhage occurs, there will be what we call necrotic changes of the tissue that is, that is adjacent to the bleeding. When you talk about necrosis, we, we know that necrosis is the, is the dying of the tissue. You know, when the tissue dies, there's reduced supply of oxygen. And you know that this fetus that is in this that, that is the second life it depends on the on oxygen and the placenta site for its for its growth and exchange of gases. So what will happen is that since there is necrosis, there is loss of that communication between the passage and the exchange of gases. There will be the detachment of the conceptus, which means it will be detached, meaning that the life there has been what has ended. With the above mechanism, this will stimulate what we call as uterine contractions. The, the, the coming in of uterine contractions, you know that when the, uter when the uterine cavity there contracts, which means the internals and the externals, what will do is that it, it will open, allowing what? Expulsion of the fetus. So basically, this is the simple pathophysiology that is occurring in abortions. What are the causes of these miscarriages or abortions? These can be divided into different parts. But we'll first start with the fetal causes of miscarriages. The 50% of these spontaneous losses are basically associated with the chromosomal abnormalities. So chromosomal abnormality is the first cause of miscarri miscarriages. In these chromosomal abnormalities, basically what we focus on too much is the autosomal triasome, which is in simple terms the non-disjunction balance location, translocation. So there's a misbalance or there's a misplacement. Instead of the balance occurring at a normal junction, it is misplaced to another junction. As a result, it is, it is more likely recognized as a foreign body. So what happens is that it's evacuated. An example of where we may talk of autosomal triasome, then this junction balance translocation is where we talk about it, triasome to one this translocation. An example is it. Down syndrome. We can also look at monosomy 45X tunnel. It, this is not more common than the 21 Down syndrome among the examples. 
but it occurs like it causes like 7% of spontaneous abortions. And basically in this one, the external, it is due to paternal sex chromosomes. We also look at what we call the tripods. These are basically in the ranges of 8 to 9% of the causes of spontaneous abortions. And it may be also caused by dysperm or failure of extrusion of the second polar body. Let's now leave the fetal causes and focus on the maternal causes. When we talk about maternal causes, here the first cause basically is what is called as diabetes, either type 1 or type 2. So the first cause of the maternal causes in miscarriages or abortions is what you call as the endocrine. Basically, when you talk about bad diabetes, you see, the poorly controlled diabetes. It can either be hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism. Another thing that will fall under the endocrine is what is called as the lithium phase defect. The lithium phase defect is a situation in which the endometrium is poorly or improperly or hormonally in, in, in prepared for implantation. We know that during the normal menstrual cycle there, in the in the phases, in the rectal phases there, there is a production of the estrogen that is transported to the endometrium to prepare it, to line it in preparation of womb, fertilization and work so that it's implanted so that the fetus starts to grow from there. So one of the causes that in the luteal phase defect, there is in poor preparation or improperly hormonally prepared, the hormones are not nicely produced and implanted on the endometrium. Another cause that may result from miscarriages under the maternum is what requires infections. When we talk about infections, most of common infections we talk about the torch infections. Under torch infections, we can talk about CMV, which is cytomegaly virus. In the extension of that, we can also talk about um, toxoplasmosis. But most common of all on infection is, um, is the herpes infection. The herpes infection are the most quantitative agents that will bring about miscarriages. Also, in exception of infection, also, we may talk about um, bacterial vaginosis. We can also talk about listeria, monocytogenes, all those among of the infections that will bring about miscarriages. In exception of the endocrine, the infections may also talk about the environmental factors, the environment that surrounds this pregnant woman. We may talk about alcohol, alcohol consumption, smoking, drug abuse, also ionization, radiation. In exception of all the fetal and the maternal causes that we've talked about, we should realize that there are also other potential causes that may bring about a miscarriage. Although these may, they are, as, as, the, as at the moment, they are said they are not demonstrable causes. Mm, but the most common causes among all is we may talk about um, an embryogenic pregnancies. Basically, this is uh, a braided ovum. But as we talk about the types of abortions, we we'll nicely explain this. Mm. So, we continue to look at other potential causes. Another potential cause that may bring about a miscarriage is what we call the multiple pregnancies, twin pregnancies. Also, an exemption of multiple pregnancies we may talk about uterine anomaly. When we talk about uterine anomaly, basically we we'll focus on cervical incompetence, which mostly occurs in mid trimesters. We may also talk about the corpus luteum failure as, as seen with the products of conception. Under this, basically what brings about the corpus luteum failure maybe it's because of less, mm, less production of um, progesterone that is eh, produced there. So also others, on the other causes, we may talk about eh, induced or criminal cause what, eh, abortions. Let's look at mm, the second trimester causes. This is where we may also talk about the cervical incompetence or unsafe abortions, tears of the cervix. But also an exception of that, we should also know that eh, for us to make this diagnosis, to know that eh, this is a miscarriage or this is an abortion, there is a certain way that this patient will come to us and present. So let's look at the presentation of this patient with a miscarriage or an abortion. The first presentation that this patient will come to you, these patients will tell you the same. They're, feeling, they're having a feeling of something giving away. 
Others will say, I'm feeling something that is it, that like I'm giving away something. But also in the exception of that, these patients is a plus or minus, they may present with they may present with a symptom, a pregnancy, prevagenal bleeding. Depending on the findings or what type of this abortion is, we can do what we call as a cervical sacrage. So a cervical sacrage is carried out at 14 to 16 weeks. Depending on the instances, it can also be done at 24 weeks gestation. Let's look at the recurrent miscarriages. These recurrent miscarriages can be divided into two or they can be split into two parts. There can be factors that can be explained and there are those other factors that are unexplained, which means they just happen. They are idiopathic, which means we still don't understand what has caused them. But let's look at the things that are explained. Basically, here we may talk about eh, the genetic factors. Genetic factors, this is where we talk about the paternum, karyotyping. Also, when we talked about endocrine, this is where we talked about the diabetes. Also, we may talk about the explained factors like anatomic factors. We're talking about the body and the cervix. Remember on the cervix here, we talked about the cervical incompetence. Also, the immu immunofactors of this patient. We also talk about the infective agents. And under the infective agents, this is where we talked about even the infections like the, the, toxoplasma, the torch infections. We gave an example of the CMV. Also, the environmental factors. Environmental factors, we talked about smoking and alcohol drinking. But it is important for us to do an investigation so that we properly know that what type of miscarriage or abortion is, is this one. The first investigation that you can do for you to confirm what type of abortion or miscarriage this is, is you do an ultrasound. Okay, so what are the things that are going to look at for you when you order an ultrasound? This, this ultrasound will show if the fetus is in the uterus, is it viable? Is there any presence of the fetal heart? So this is the importance of this ultrasound. When you do an ultrasound, our focus will be, you look at, is there any fetal pore there? We, in short, we are focusing on the viability of, of the fetus. But also, another investigation that we can do is a beta HCG. We know that in a normal preg in, a, in a pregnancy, the HCG within 48 hours, it doubles by 50%. And when a miscarriage has occurred, which means this HCG will do what? Will reduce. Also, it is important to focus on the what? The full blood count. Here, we'll look at the, um, the WBCs to draw out infections in case of who? septic abortions and also our focus is we know that when there's a miscarriage depending on what type it is there's lots of blood we also focus on the hemoglobin we also check the racers group which will also help us in these patients now to go into details let us now look at all the types of abortions with their clinical features we know that there is a threatened abortion there is inevitable abortion there is incomplete abortion there is missed abortion, a septic abortion. Also, there is what you call as a recurrent abortion. Let's go to the first one. So, the first abortion that we'll look at is threatened abortion. So, what are the clinical features of threatened abortion? One thing that we should know before we go into full details of these abortions is that yeah, for you to make a diagnosis to say this is an abortion, before maybe you do those other investigations, these patients, when you do the history, they have to pass the history of amenorrhea. And to define amenorrhea, you know that amenorrhea, this is like yeah, lack of menses or missing of menses. Because we cannot really make a diagnosis to say this is an abortion when this patient of ours hasn't passed the history of amenorrhea because there are a lot of things that may bring about vision yeah, of bleeding in women. So for you to know that basically here what you're doing, we're dealing with is eh, an abortion. This woman has to pass an history of oh, amenorrhea in threatened abortion. So first point first, amenorrhea, which is followed by slight vaginal eh, bleeding. And in threatened abortion, one thing that you should notice is that this patient will not present with eh, pain. And when you do a vaginal examination, you find that eh, the cervix is eh, closed. So this is basically the, the clinical feature that we have in, what, in threatened abortion. Let us go to our second type of abortion, which is inevitable abortion. First things first, the clinical features. This woman will present you with a history of 
amenorrhea, which is followed by vaginal bleeding. In, so the difference with the threat and inevitable is that in this type of abortion now, this patient will, will come with the pain. Pain follows the bleeding. So when the pain follows the bleeding, sometimes it's important to give a differential or suspect that this may be, it's a possible ectopic pregnancy, which can be ruled out with the investigation that we can do like an ultrasound to show us to say, this is an ectopic um, pregnancy. If it hasn't even object. To continue with the inevitable abortion, when you look at the uterus, we know that in a normal pregnancy, there are a lot of physiological changes that will take place. But when this woman is pregnant and uh, as, the, as the pregnancy grows, depending on the gestation age, we know that the size of the uterus is supposed to, to, to change, it's supposed to be growing. So in inevitable abortion, what you, what you find that the uterus may be smaller or it may be larger or corrected within the dates. When you do a, a vaginal examination, the cervix is dilating, and the product of conception may be passing through the water through the cervical OC. Let's look at incomplete abortion. So, the relationship between complete abortion and inevitable are just the same. Okay, so we may see that incomplete abortion comes from inevitable. So all the features of incomplete abortion and inevitable are the same. But what really signifies the incomplete abortion is that here there are products of conception that have passed, but the other products of conception that have done what that have remained. We know that inevitable um, um, abortion, there are products of conception that are passing at that moment. So here in incomplete, here, the products of conception that have passed. But part of them, they have remained, which means the cervical ossi on this patient, if you do a vaginal examination, the ossi is still open. This woman is still bleeding. It's because the uterus hasn't contracted. They are still watching products of conception. How are we going to manage our patient who's come with incomplete or inevitable abortion? So these patients, they will need an active management. When you talk about the active management, which means we have to control the bleeding. So... We we'll control the bleeding here. We we'll ensure that all the products of conception that have remained in there, the membranes, the tissues of what have been evacuated. But also, we secure the IV axis. We group and save. We give IM ergometry and we arrange for evacuation of the uterus. If the uterus, this is something that we should note and focus on and pay attention to. If the uterus is greater than 12 weeks, you set up a syntocinone infusion to cause the reduction of the uterine size before we undertake the water, the evacuation. To continue, let us look at complete abortion. The clinical features of complete abortion is that this patient of yours will come to you to say, I was bleeding, but I've now stopped. So when you look at the uterus, it's smaller than expected. Why is the uterus smaller than expected in this patient? We know that this is a complete abortion, and in complete abortion, all the products of conception that are there, they are passed out. As a result, we know that if all products of conception are passed, this uterus will do what? Will contract. If you do a vaginal examination on this patient of yours, you find that the cervical ocean is closed. The conservative management is indicated, but basically, if we suspect that maybe there may be a little bit of products of conception that have remained, it's okay. You can do an ultrasound. And in complete abortion, what are you going to see in on ultrasound? You see that eh, there is not any viable fetus that is there, and the cervical host has closed. Let us look at another part of um, miscarriage, which is called the blighted ovum, or others we call it an embry embryonic pregnancy. So this is the type of um, Miscarriage whereby there is a pregnancy rather whereby there's a gestation sac that is formed. When this gestation sac is formed, there is no fetus that is formed in this sac. And this, this pregnancy also will present with all the same signs and symptoms eh, of a pregnancy. For you to really make a diagnosis to know that eh, this is a brighted ovum, you do an ultrasound, and on ultrasound you only see an empty sac. The, ma the management of righted ovum is the same as eh, missed abortion. We'll talk about this management together when we're talking about eh, 
missed abortion. So let's talk about missed abortion. In missed abortion, what is happening is that there is retention of all products of conception after death of the embryo or the fetus. Okay, what are the features of missed abortion? The clinical features that this woman presents with amenorrhea with a slight episode of vaginal bleeding. And what happens is that in this missed abortion, all the normal signs and symptoms of, of a pregnancy, they are gone. Or we say the irrigation of all area signs and symptoms of pregnancy, the morning sickness, the, the rena nigra there, they all disappear. And when you look at the uterus, the uterus becomes small. When you look at the cervix, the cervix is closed. So, how are we going to manage? Remember that we said the management of Mr. abortion and uh, the bracket ovum are the same. We can do the conservative management whereby we, we leave it alone because the body has the ability to absorb them. The, the body can absorb the, the, the sac, sometimes even the fetus, but also where there can be a simultaneous expulsion that may occur on its own. But what is the disadvantage to these two is that uh, there are high risk of DIC due to psychological morbidity. So, who we'll continue with the management? This is very important and something that you should always pay attention to. If the pregnancy is less than nine weeks gestation, we can go in with the, a medical treatment. When you talk about this medical treatment, now this is when we talk about the combined oral mifeprostin. That is the, followed by the vaginal prostaglandin. But also, if the uterus is less than 12 weeks, we may proceed with the evacuation under water, general anesthesia. So, if the uterus is less than 12 weeks, we can still go ahead with it, the use of the vaginal prostaglandins, whereby we induce them abortion. So, this is it, the legal, the legal way on which what we can terminate what the pregnancy. Let us, look at, let us now look at a missed miscarriage. So in a missed miscarriage, what happens is that sometimes there's only spotting. And this is mostly in, the, in, in between the 6 to 12 weeks after the last menstrual period. And when you do an ultrasound on these patients, you find that there is a presence of a fetal fall. An indication to say that there is a continuation of pregnancy. Let us look at now uh, at septic abortion. So basically, septic abortion comes in as a result of incomplete abortion. Remember when we talked about incomplete abortion, we, talked, we said that there still remain products of conception that are there. So as a result of this prolonged remain products of conception that have remained in the uterus, these are what to bring about now the sepsis in, in this patient resulting to what? Uh, septic abortion. For you to make a diagnosis to know that this is a septic ab ab um, abortion, this patient will come to you with uh, signs of prexia. We know that prexia is uh, high fever, that is uh, above 38 degrees. There will also be tachycardia. Other patients will come about with uh, generalized body malaise. But in exception of all those things, uh, these patients will come with um, abdominal pain. There will be tenderness on the abdomen. In exception of that, we would also say there will be prurient pelvic tenderness. Other patients will come with the vaginal discharge. But it is important also to know that there are also, when you look at, when we go to surgery, there are, when you look at the acute abdomen, there are a lot of things that may also present in the same way. So it is important to exclude other causes that may present in the same way. Those are what we would call uh, differential diagnosis. What is the pathogenesis here? Basically, when we talk about the pathogenesis, we're looking at the organisms that may really cause uh, septic abortion. The most common of all is E. coli and other gram negative, we may talk about in uh, streptococcus hemolytic and analogic and all other analogs that may bring about um, uh, sepsis, even staphylococcus, yeah, all those things that are part of the organisms that will cause. Will cause the sepsis. In most cases, you find that in 80% of these patients, 
the infection is small and it's confined to the decidia. But it can spread to the myometrium and even beyond 15% of it. Remember that when we talked about the pathophysiology and introduction to miscarriages or rather abortions, we say that the hemorrhage starts from where the decidia is there. So where, that is where the infection really want to confine there because you know that necrosis has happened at that site. So th that is where the 80% of the infection is, is found. And 5% causes the, the more of generalized sizes and symptoms. What is the management? In this management phase, we can even focus on the investigation. On investigation, we may do a cervical swab. Okay? We may do a cervical swab. Um, we're looking at the... On cervical swab, we may do MCAs, and also we do the coagulation. We can also look at the, the UNDs. To focus on the management and others who await on the, the culture results, it is important to put these patients on broad spectrum antibiotics. If it is in a mild case, uh, in the presentation of the signs we talked about, their mouth, we can start these patients on um, oral antibiotics. But if it is presenting with severe cases before the culture results have come, it is important to, to give these patients IV antibiotics. Depending on the results and the findings that have come with the investigations that we've carried out, we can do an evacuation of them uterus after a reasonable amount of tissue levels, uh, after a reasonable amount of antibiotics that have been given or any signs if there are any changes. And also if this woman has, she feels she's, there's still no need of uh, having or conceiving another pregnancy, we can evacuate them, the pregnancy. Let us look at uh, the last part of my presentation where we'll, we'll look at the recurrent miscarriage. How are we going to define or how are we going to make a diagnosis to say this is a recurrent miscarriage? So we we'll define a recurrent miscarriage when this woman has spontaneous loss of pregnancy, three conservative losses of pregnancy under 20 weeks of gestation from the last menstrual period, which is the LMP. But for you to really maintain this diagnosis, it should be three conservative spontaneous pregnancies, one. Two, we should also focus on the what? The gestation age, which should be less than 20 weeks. And note that for you, for this to be complete, it should be with the same sexual partner. So we can define the current miscarriage, we can put it into two ways, we can say it's primary, or it can be secondary. But in instances, it's 1% of women of the reproductive age. So let's look at a primary or recurrent or the primary recurrent pregnancy loss. This usually refers to a couple that has never cons never had any live birth. For us to, to talk about the live birth, we know that the pregnancy that has passed the gestation age, the viable gestation age. Definition of the secondary recurrent miscarriage, uh, it will refer to those who have had a repetitive loss following one successive pregnancy. So this is a couple that has had a one successive pregnancy that has passed the viability and they conceive nicely, but in the next episodes of trying to conceive again, they are, they are all the next pregnancies, they are loss. This is where we call it a secondary recurrent pregnancy loss. So it is important also to bring about the psychological counseling in these patients who have um, who have lost the, the, the pregnancy or who've had an abortion. It is not important for us health practitioners or um, to to make these patients feel like it's because of the it's because of them that they have lost the pregnancy because these will have a psychological effect um, on their lives. Let us look at the causes of um, recurrent miscarriages. Mm, one of the causes is the polycystic ovarian syndrome on the um, luteinized, on the LOS hypersecretion. We know that sometimes there's, um, there's low secretion of progesterone that will bring about uh, the condition of polycystic ovarian syndrome. In exception of that, what may also result into uh, recurrent miscarriage is um, anatomic factors. 
when you look at anatomic factors here we're talking about um, congenital defects cervical incompetence we know that if there's the cervix cannot hold this pregnancy every time this woman tries to conceive she will lose this pregnancy above all fibroids we know what fibroids are these are benign myomas that arise from the overgrowth of the smooth mu smooth muscles in extension of that chromosomal defects which is four percent among the causes what investigation are you going to do for for your patient who's come who who's had uh, recurrent miscarriages you can do a pelvic under mm, pelvic ultrasound you can also look at what you call the lupus anticoagulant and anti chondropin antibodies we can also do his telescopy for this patient also it is important to to do the random uh, blood sugar because we know we talked about the endocrine among the maternal causes that come about let us look at um, induced abortion induced abortion it can be criminal or it can be medical when you say criminal which means uh, there is no any advice that has come from any experienced uh, medical practitioner to induce this pregnancy but when you talk about medical um, this is where we you there's a use of prostaglandins that is done within the premises of the hospital grounds and we've outweighed uh, the risk the, the the safety of this patient so when you just look at the law and the, the law and the, therape the, the therapeutic of abortion in Zambia. Um, abortion is legal in Zambia, provided that um, it's been done by a licensed me medical practitioners and, and the life of the patient has been outweighed. And when we look at the, the legality of it, which means that uh, three doctors or any uh, specialized people have agreed on it, patient to guess, also, You've made a comparison to look at the safety uh, of this of this woman. Um, in case of any questions for this tutorial, uh, you are welcome to ask. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time.